song all the glory to the God of love And if you can, he's moving on the wind. words of those of that song all the glory to the God of love and we are here this morning to give God all the glory we have to be careful probably singing a song with derechos in the area of let the wind blow let it blow just a little bit but certainly the spirit of God is in this place and we're going to lift him up and worship I'm going to invite you all to stand with me 
We're going to lift a prayer. God, we truly give you all the glory, all the thanks. Lord, we know your spirit is in this place. And Lord, we just lift our hearts, our souls, our spirits to you. Lord, fill this room with your presence and, uh, and change hearts, change our minds. And, and Lord, just we pray that revival truly would come, that it would start right here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to start with a song called Year of Victory. around us give them a fist bump real quick and say this is your year of victory I think it's my picks it might be my picks I think they're cutting it all right good God almighty Up like you do every time. I get amnesia. 
Jesus. It really is. You may be seated. It's all about Jesus. You know, if it's not about Jesus, we wouldn't be here. I want you to know that. You know, uh, I'm going to call up some folks to help me pray today. I'm going to, Kim, I'm going to ask you to help me come up and pray. How about Terry? You come up and help me pray. How about, uh, why don't we have uh, uh, Tom and Holly, you come, come up, you know, and maybe, I, who else wants to volunteer and help me pray? One more. We get one, no, no, I need adult to help me pray. Brenda, come on up. Okay, hallelujah. And we're going to have the kids come on up, and we're just going to pray. And for, you, for maybe our visitors, we pray for our kids every week. And so if you would just stay there and you would extend your hands out and just pray blessings over your young, our young people. And uh, we're very grateful that you bring them to church, okay? And we're grateful for that. Come on up, kids. We're going to pray for you. Had a little technical difficulty, sorry folks. Day. 
want you to, I just feel like, you know, Jesus is looking over the corridors of heaven when we started singing that song, How Great Are You, God? And I just think that you brought a smile on the face of Jesus today. I think as you and I acknowledge the greatness of our God, all those problems, all those circumstances, all those things that are trying to steal and kill and destroy from us. When we magnify the greatness of God, we still have those problems, saints, but they get smaller in His presence. They get smaller in His presence. You know what I know? In His presence, there is fullness of joy. In His presence, demons have to flee. In His presence, there is rest. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. You know, I think it was this song when we were a couple weeks ago in Springfield, Missouri, and Louis Giglio. I mean, we heard 8,200 men sing this song, How Great Is Our God. And I think Louis Giglio made a point. He said, you know what makes this song timeless? We're magnifying God. We're not talking about us at all, basically. Like, sing with us, but that's it. We're just talking about how great God is. And you and I can't go wrong when we talk about the greatness and the goodness and the grandeur of God. You know, I know His Spirit is here. I know His Spirit is here. That Spirit of God who's wooing us. He's walked down this front aisle here, uh, aisleway. He's going among the chairs here. He wants to touch your hearts. You know, I'm not naive to think that everybody walked in here, their honkies are honkies and their dories are dories. But I tell you what, as we get ready to sing this through again, I want you, would you give whatever's troubling you to Jesus today? I tell you what, he'll gladly receive it from you. He'll gladly receive it to you. But he's not going to steal it out of your hands. You're going to have to give it to him. Let's just let the Spirit of God continue to touch our hearts and minister to us. Jesus, all I really want is you. All I really need is you. Jesus, all I really want is you. All I
you know, I just want us to take a few moments. And I want you to think about the goodness and the greatness of God in your life. I want you to maybe look back a day, a week, a month, maybe this past year. I just want you to take a few moments. You know, the wonderful thing about today is we're not in any big rush because we're eating here afterwards. Hallelujah. Okay. So nobody's uh, gross is going to burn or anything like that. Hallelujah. But I want you just to think about the goodness of God and the greatness of God in your life and how he has been with you through this past year. And maybe, you know, I want you just to thank him right where you're at. Just tell Jesus thank you. Just tell him thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for being in my marriage, Lord God, for Meryl and I, Lord God. We thank you for making it strong, Lord Jesus. We thank you for being with them healthy. We're grateful for that, Lord God. We thank you for our children, spouses, Lord God, that, that Lord God, they're going to fall in love with Jesus more and more every day, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for our home, Lord God, what you provide for us. We thank you, Lord God, for the gifts and talents you deposited within this body of Christ, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We're grateful, Jesus. We're grateful, Jesus. How great is our God? And now you might be saying, Pastor Jeff, I got some unanswered questions yet. Some unanswered prayers. You know what? We all do. And you know what God is saying this morning? Let's take a step of faith. And let's thank you for that answer. Yes, maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's, it's a child. Maybe it's something. Maybe it's a relationship that needs healing. Let's thank him in advance. Let's say thank you, Jesus, for taking care of that situation, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, that we're not going to let the devil steal, kill, and destroy in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for opening up the eyes of my understanding that I can see what you want me to see in the name of Jesus. Let's thank you. We praise you, Lord God, for that. And before we were seated, I just want to sing to that little chorus again, The Splendor of the King. Because I want you, if you would, ask Jesus to open up your spiritual eyes. It was like in Isaiah chapter 6, King Uzziah died, but it says that Isaiah, he said, I looked up and his train, his glory filled the temple. And I want you to know, Jesus, open our spiritual eyes. Let us see your glory fill this temple here today in the name of Jesus. The splendor of the King. Sing it to Jesus. Floating majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at And I just want us to just stay in that attitude of worship because, you know, when we get in these moments like this, 
I think that really strips away a lot of the stuff that we've had to go through in life. I mean, we sing that song, all I really needed, all I really wanted is you, Jesus. Am I the only one that gets bombarded every day thinking you need the new and improve this or the new and improve that? And what we really do when we get in that, the presence of the Lord that way, it strips all that facade away. And I hope you will really realize that. You know, uh, before uh, uh, we dismiss the kids, you know, a few things I want to talk about. Number one, our summer camps for our 8th through 12th graders. I hope you've signed up. If you haven't signed up, I hope you will today because I promise you there will not be much time left at the jamesriverchurch.org. Uh, I think we might have eight kids going right now. That's going to be July 17th through the 21st. I hope you'll go. I really will. Uh, we just sang a song. All I ever needed, all I ever wanted is you, Jesus. All those other things come and go. You know, all those other things come and go. What we really need, our foundation is Jesus. Amen. So I hope you'll, you'll be a part of that. We thank you for all the people that came today. Maybe you were invited, my friends and family. You know what? If you just happen to walk through the church doors today, you hit the jackpot. We're eating afterwards, hallelujah, okay? You didn't even get an invitation, and so we're grateful for that, you'll, and I hope you'll stay. Uh, I don't know if you drew, draw, drove up Stan and, and Seth. They got their cookers going or getting ready to go, and they got their little tent there, rain, sleet, or snow. We're having a cookout, hallelujah, okay? And uh, I'm glad that you're here, and I'm, I'm grateful for everybody. There's a lot of work that takes place to put this on, and, you know, there's, you know I know maybe you come and you think, oh, this is nice. There's not fairy angels doing all this, hallelujah. There are actually people coming and do these things, and I want to thank all the people for doing that so very, very much. And I want to also thank you, you know, for, it's because we can, because of your giving, we can do things like this. And I want to thank you for your giving. You know, and I know sometimes in life, Meryl and I have been there, where giving has hurt. I mean, it hurts to do something like that, but it's always rewarding. And I want to thank you for, maybe sometimes when you do give, your tithes, your gifts, your offerings, that it does hurt, but you were obedient because we found out God blesses obedience. We learned at the men's conference, they talked about it in Samuel, obedience is better than sacrifice. And what I learned from that, I think my father-in-law taught me this before he passed on, man of 65 years of the ministry. He said, Jeff, you can never gain back through sacrifice. Listen. You can never gain back through sacrifice what you lost in disobedience. Let me say that again. You can never gain back through sacrifice what you lost in disobedience. How many times, maybe, you ever seen a kid? Do you tell them to do something, they don't do it, then when the hammer comes down, they say, no, 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 I'll do it now. It's too late. Okay, so never forget that, amen? But I want to thank you also very much for your your generosity, okay? I really believe we feel we are so blessed here at Christ the King, having an oasis kind of in a desert, so to, so to speak. I want to thank you so much for that. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the family and friends, Lord God, that, that have come today, Lord God, to, to hear about Jesus and, this, and, and to break bread with us, so to speak, Lord God, over a meal. I thank you for all the people that have prepared beforehand and all the ones that are still doing it right now, Lord God, that we can just, Lord God, let people know that this is what the church of Jesus Christ is all about. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we just ask for, I think of all the people that maybe with this derecho, Lord God, that you would just be with them, Lord God, and help them as they try to put their lives back together, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we just thank you. We praise you for our, for our, our, our officials in, in national office and state office and local offices. We pray, Lord God, that they will humble themselves and seek the Almighty God, Lord Jesus, they will do what you want them to do, and give them the strength and the courage to follow through in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, I just ask that when the people bring their tithes, their gifts, their offerings, that Lord, you said you would open the windows of heaven upon them, that you would pour out a blessing they could not contain, that you would rebuke the devourer for their sake, and you would not allow their fruit to cast off the vine until due season. We thank you for that, Lord God, and we thank you for your word will not return void in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, be, you know, I'm going to show you a little, uh, a little slide up there. Maybe, Brad, I don't have a music. Could I have you come up here and just kind of strum a song, okay, as we do this? You know, because 
it doesn't seem as long as when there's music playing. Okay, you know what I'm saying? And so, uh, and, and, and you know, I knew how to do PowerPoint when I had the old Windows version, and I could put the thing, it says three seconds, and it would switch and all this and that. Well, the new version, I tried it, tried to put it, the old version didn't work. So Reed is, if the slide is too long, just look at Reed, he'll push the button, okay? But uh, it's the finger button pushing back there, okay? And we're going to show you what we have done here in the last maybe month or so. And, you know, and we've had a lot of fun. And we just know that, you know, God, you know, being a Christian is not sucking lemons, okay, and not having any fun. Being a Christian is enjoying life. And I, we want you to know we're enjoying life. Amen. You can put it up there, Reed, if you would, please. And then you can just play however you want. You can sing whatever you want to. You'll want to go back to the first slide, though. Okay? Uh, now it's doing everything automatically. That won't work. That's too fast. You're going to have to play faster, okay? Listen to these words. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate that. Hallelujah. Amen. I wish, I, you know, well, I, I'll try to put that on our on, on our face our uh, web page so you can look at all those things because we had a, a wonderful time we really did for some of you if you saw the uh, the uh, men's tree, uh, retreat now Ron and Daryl were not in those pictures because they went down with their wives okay and they had some spent the night with their friends but we had 11 men go down there for that and so we were really really blessed to have such a great group and I hope you men will want to go with us next year okay because it really is a time to, to touch people's hearts we're going to ask Brad and Jennifer and their family come up here. This is their last uh, Sunday with us. Uh, Brad and Jennifer, they're getting ready to move to Cherokee, uh, okay? And uh, it's been amazing uh, watching these kids grow especially, okay? Little Channing, I remember when he was really small, okay? I remember when Grace was taller. Oh, she still might be. I see Maddie wore high, a lot, big heels, hallelujah. I remember I had the hardest time remembering Grace's name. I called her Faith so many times. I knew it was Grace or Faith or one of them. Okay, hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, one of those religious names. And then I remembered she was Gigi. 
Grace Griffin. Okay, I can remember that. Okay, and we're we're grateful for for Brad too. I I know Jennifer has gone down and helped with the kids a lot with Channing and Maddie and and Grace. She always helps us like with our uh, presentations and all that. Bradley. He's looking more like Jesus all the time, isn't he? Hallelujah. He's even growing a beard now and all that. Hallelujah. And, uh, and, and he has helped us so much. He really has. I remember when, when we came five years ago, Bradley was really a quiet guy. He really was. And then all of a sudden he played Jesus and he's half dressed in front of everybody. I thought, boy, this kid has really gotten bold. Hallelujah. Okay. No, I'm embarrassing him now. Okay. <laughs> but at least you put the hair in front of you. Okay. Yes. And, you know, and, and Grace, I, we've got to watch you grow up so much. Uh, her, she's, she's going to graduate from Elk Point. Grace just finished her junior year at Elk Point. So her and Mom, they have a place that they're going to stay so she can finish her, her, uh, her senior year over at Elk Point. We're happy for that. And Maddie and Channing, they're moving over to Cherokee with, with Dad there for that until they get all these things settled out. And Jennifer is actually uh, going to take over a State Farm uh, uh, agency over there. And Brad's still going to be, like, is that a general manager, regional manager, whatever in life, you know. And so they're going to be moving over there. And, you know, Brad has really helped us in the last five years. Not only has he grown a lot, we've grown a lot. And, and, and we're going to miss you. I want you to know the whole family. We're going we're gonna to miss you all, your smiling faces. But I tell you, as a pastor, it's really nice. I have a comfort zone with Brad. I really do. I've only had that with my wife as far as with leading worship. And he just kind of knows what to do, and, and I want to tell you for that, you know, and you're always invited to come back, hallelujah, you know, and, and, and maybe not during the summer because we're changing to nine o'clock, but if you really can't find something in Cherokee, you know, uh, maybe we can have you come and spend the night at our house. Okay, we've done that before, Marilyn and I. We've had people come and spend the night on Saturday night. I, I'm just teasing you, really, but, but you could come if you wanted to, okay? But we want to pray a blessing because I'm a firm believer how you go out is how you are received. Mm -hmm. I believe that. And, and Brad, he came and talked to me, I think it was in January, about how this new opportunity was coming. And I said, Brad, all I ask is that you give us an opportunity to bless you guys. I want you guys, if you guys would hold hands as a family, you guys extend your hands out. We're going to pray blessings over the Griffin family. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I do thank you and I praise you, Lord God, for Channing, for Maddie, for Grace, for Bradley, for Jennifer, for Brad, Lord God. We thank you. We praise you for their walk with you, Jesus. And Lord, we are saddened as individuals that they're going to be leaving us. But Lord God, we're excited for the new journey you have for them. That Lord God, wherever you guide, you always provide. And we thank you. We praise you for the Griffin family. We just pray blessings upon blessings upon this family, Lord God. And we know the best is yet to come for them. We ask, Lord God, that you would continue to let them find favor not only with you, Lord God, but with man. And we thank you and praise the Lord God for just making the right place for them spiritually, the right church that they can find, that they can put their roots down and grow in, Lord God, and, and be a blessing to that fellowship like they've been a blessing to us. And we thank you and praise for the Griffin family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you. Thanks, Bradley. I tell you, he has grown up a lot, too, Holly. Channing, God bless you. Amen. God bless you, Jennifer. Amen. Thank you. Thank Maddie. God bless you, dear. Thanks, Grace. Amen. We're standing up for you guys. We're standing up for you guys. God bless you. Thank you. I have something for you. And here, Brad, come here. We have one more thing here. Come here. Caleb, if you imagine, Caleb made this. And it says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him. And you have helped his people and continue to help them. And that's out of Hebrews 6.10. And that's, and that's from the CKCC band, if you look at there, he did all that. But thank you, guys. You might be gone, but you won't be forgotten. I want you to know that. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks again. Now we're going to dismiss the kids. They can go downstairs, okay? No hamburgers down there. You wait for us. Hallelujah, okay? You know... What I want to talk about today is Jesus is my best friend. Well, you know, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus wants to be your best friend. Would you do that? Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus wants to be your best friend. You know, many if not all of our visitors here today are here as a result of someone inviting 
you. Whether you recognize it or not, an invitation is very, very powerful. I believe that you are blessed to have someone invite you here today because they care about you and they consider you a friend. There is someone, though, much greater than the person that invited you here that considers you a friend and his name is Jesus. And he does call you friend. Over in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, these are the words of Jesus. It says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I have command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all the things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. See, each of us need to know that Jesus didn't come to this earth to spoil your fun or to make your life miserable. I said this, too many Christians look like they've been baptized in lemon juice, okay? Too many Christians look sadder when they leave church than when they came to church. And you know what? Jesus did not come to destroy our fun or to make life miserable at any means. Jesus, though, wants to direct your life. Jesus wants to direct my life so we can live an abundant life. See, what we really have to settle today and every day is, do you think Jesus is for you more than against you? Do you think Jesus wants your life to be a blessing more than you want your life to be a blessing? I believe he does. You know, I believe this. See, when I believe Jesus died, it tells us in Galatians that he became a curse for us, that the blessings of Abraham would fall upon us, the Gentiles. That doesn't mean we're all going to be rich. That doesn't mean we're all going to have fancy cars and big homes. But God wants to bless us. In fact, really, one of the blessings found in the Beatitudes, it says this, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. See, have you ever been persecuted for doing something right and you didn't say what a blessing it was? If you're like me, you probably whined and said, why me? But God says that's a blessing. See, we can't be a blessing to anybody else unless we're first a blessing ourselves. It says in John 10:10, 10, 10, once again, the words of Jesus, the thief, the thief is the devil. Everybody say the devil. The devil does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus is, but I have come, but Jesus has come that you might have life and more abundantly. See, somehow this message has gotten lost in the church of Jesus Christ. Because if people really believed it, the churches would be full every Sunday morning. Okay, they really would be. But for too many times, we're going to find out going to church and belonging to a church and belonging to the family of Jesus isn't about a bunch of rules and regulations. I tell you what, folks, I cannot keep a track on what you're doing in life. And that's not my job to do it. Okay? My job is to help you get closer to Jesus. See, if you get closer to Jesus, then you'll do what Jesus wants you to do. And if you do what Jesus wants you to do, your life is going to be blessed. And so it's not about a bunch of rules and regulations. But what we need to realize is a friendship with Jesus does not come without responsibilities. And a friendship with Jesus should not be governed by rules. It should be governed by our love to please him. Our love to please him. I've used this illustration many, many times here at Christ the King and in the 40 plus years that Meryl and I have been in the ministry is what keeps someone faithful to their spouse? Is it a ring? Is it a piece of paper? No. What keeps somebody faithful to their spouse? A love for them. People have committed adultery with their wedding rings on. People have committed adultery before their wedding had been dissolved. So those things don't keep you faithful. 
What keeps you faithful to your spouse is your love for them. See, I could give you the rule. I mean, get it. when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt, all God did was give them ten rules, the Ten Commandments. How'd that work out? Not very well, did it? Ten. Everybody say ten. I mean, doggone, that means we only have to obey one a day, and then three other days, two a day, and we'd be okay in life. But see, rules don't change hearts. Rules don't make good relationships. A love makes a great relationship. Somebody might come along to you and say, Hey, mister, or hey, miss, I think you're pretty good looking. And you know what you say? So does my wife. So does my husband. Your love for them is what keeps you faithful. Think of all the people that travel around our country and they're nowhere near their spouses. They could, quote, get away with something. And you know what I found out as I've talked to people like that? You don't get away with it. The devil tells you, go and do this, you deserve it. But after you do it, people have told me, then he'll bring guilt and shame upon your life. So what should our relationship with Jesus be governed on? Not a bunch of rules, but on a relationship with Jesus, a love. We want to please him. It says over in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, this is the Apostle Paul. If you remember about the Apostle Paul, he said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. He was a tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He had all the religious pedigree you could have ever dreamed about. But look, he says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. What was Paul saying? I want to please God because I love him. Because I love him. Very, very important. See, Jesus came to this earth because of one reason and one reason only, love. That's the only reason Jesus came to the earth. First, a love for his father. And because of the love of his father, he wanted to be obedient to do the father's will. Read your Bible. Jesus said, I only say the things I hear my father say. I only do the things I see my father do. See, he loved his father enough. That governed his entire life because he wanted to be pleasing to his father. So he loved the father first, but second, a love for you and me. A love that compelled him to suffer shame and torture on a cross that he would call you and me friend. That we could call him Lord. Several things we must remember about friendships. Number one, friendships are not selfish. Friendships are not selfish. Friendships involve giving. Friendships believe the best in the other person. Friendships must be based on mutual respect and commitment to each other. And friendships require sacrifice. Time, talent, and treasures. That's what friendships are. See, friendships are vital and important to individuals. Because you know why? God didn't create us to be island Christians, okay? He didn't create us to be Robinson Crusoe Christians. He created us to be bridges from people to people. You know, I hear people tell me sometimes, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Maybe you don't. But why wouldn't you want to come to church? You know, see, God hasn't created you so you can sit in your house and not be around anybody else. Wouldn't that be a great sterile environment? See, there are people that don't think they need to come to church. You're, see, you think it's all about you. Come on, this is good up here. It's not about you. Maybe God wants to use you on a Sunday morning to speak a positive word to somebody else, but because you think it's about you, you don't darken the doors of the church, you don't get to be the blessing God called you to be. That is good preaching, hallelujah. Come on. I know people. I had somebody once say, well, you know what? I, I like watching it on television. I said, it doesn't work that way. Now, if you can't make it here, I think it's a wonderful thing. Do you understand? It's, it's how God has blessed us. But I think if we can get up and get to church, we should get up and get to church. Hallelujah. I know that might seem old-fashioned, okay? But you know what? If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. It tells me that Jesus went, it says, as was his custom, he went to Sabbath. He went to synagogue. 
So Jesus, who was perfect, thought he should come to church or to Sabbath or synagogue. And you know, it's like I tell people this. Sports. Who likes sports? Oh, it's fun. Anybody here like baseball? Anybody ever play baseball on Nintendo? I haven't, but or maybe do you have a... I'm sure there's a baseball game out there. Is it the same as going and having a fastball go by you? Come on. What's more fun? Come on. Getting a hit on Nintendo or getting a hit in the flesh? Hallelujah. Come on. I know what it is. It's getting a hit there. Because you know what? When you get a hit in the flesh, you know what you get to do? You get to celebrate with your team. You get a base hit in Nintendo. Go and tell your wife. You know what she's going to say? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Hope you had a grand slam next time. Okay, hallelujah. Because you know what? It's never the same except in person. God did not create us to be islands to get holed up in our own little homes and never go out. God created us to be bridges to go around and to help other people's lives. And it's very important. That's just a bird chirping in church. Hallelujah. Okay. What? No, it's Andy Griffin. Hallelujah. Okay. I thought it was a bird. Okay. Mayberry RFD. Okay. See, one of the greatest friendships maintained in the Bible was between David and Jonathan. David was going to take Jonathan's place as the next king of Israel. And both of them didn't allow envy and jealousy and pride and strife to separate their friendship. A little backstory here. David, you remember Saul, uh, Jonathan's dad was having troubles with evil spirits, and David came in and he'd play the harp, and it'd bring him, uh, it, it would relax him. We found out that before that, uh, Saul, when they were fighting the Philistines and Goliath, Saul would not go out and fight the, the Philistine Goliath, so David came along and killed him. And the song was, Saul has killed his thousand, but David has killed his ten thousand. And you know what? Saul got envious of that. So then Saul tried to kill him for decades, literally years, okay? About 15, I think it was. He was running around trying, escaping. And all of a sudden, so all of a sudden, so after Saul, the next person in line was Jonathan, his oldest boy. But when David started coming into the castle and all this, Jonathan and David were about the same age, so they became friends good friends and you know what then all of a sudden because of saul's disobedience god told him he said i'm going to take the kingdom of israel away from you i'm going to give it to david who could have been jealous jonathan wasn't jonathan supposed to be the next king but jonathan didn't let envy and strife and jealousy get into that friendship with david in fact, uh, so, so after, uh, after Saul has thrown a spear at him a couple of times, and Jonathan said, David, my dad isn't going to kill you. And David said, I think your dad's going to kill me. So Jonathan said, you know what? You go out and hide in the field, and I'm going to shoot some arrows out there, and I'll have my servant go and get the arrows. And if I say this, it means this. If I say that, it means that. So he shot the arrows out there. The servant went and got him. And then we find here in 1 Samuel 20, verse 40 and 41 and 2, it says, as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place towards the south, fell down three times, and they kissed one another, and they wept together. But David more so. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace. This is a, I want to meet Jonathan when I get to heaven. I really do. What a man. He was supposed to be the next king, and he's willing to give it all up because, number one, he knew God had taken it away from his dad, and then he didn't get bitter about it and said, my best friend is going to be the next king. That's like in sports, you're the backup quarterback, and you're good friends with that, with starting quarterback, and all of a sudden the coach decides we're going to start the backup. How many quarterbacks, uh, the first teamers are going to say, I'm all for you? Very few. Jonathan was that kind of guy to David. In fact, Jonathan said, you know what? When you become king, he basically saying, I'll serve you. Can you imagine that? The king in waiting says, I'll serve you. The one who supposedly came from royalty said, you know what? I will bow down to you, and you can take my place. What a friendship. Have you ever called anybody and asked if they could come and help you mow the yard? And they said, no. 
Come on. Hey, I need a little help today. Sorry, I'm busy. Jonathan is willing to give up his whole life for his friend David. What a friendship. Another great friendship mentioned in the Bible is Jesus and John the Baptist. Yes, they were cousins, but they were also friends. It says in John 3.30, it says, this is what, I'm telling you what, uh, John the Baptist, man, it's cooking for John the Baptist. It is. He's having revival meetings. People are coming by the thousands. They're coming to the Jordan River. They're getting baptized. Everything is going what he had ever dreamed about in ministry. And then one day up uh, across the desert comes Jesus. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And he said, and you know what? This is John the Baptist saying, I must decrease and he must increase. What a friend. I mean, he's cooking, man. He's, he's, he, I mean, he has ministry opportunities out six months a year, every weekend. I mean, it's good. And he says, no, I'm going to step away. I must decrease. And he must. Well, wouldn't it be nice to see that in our culture? Sometimes they won't even open the door for you. You, somebody opened the door, you try to get them. No, they scoot right in. I'm saying, okay, I, I'm okay with that. See, who is your best friend in life? Who is your best friend in life? I believe many times the people we think who are our best friends are really not our best friends. Because our best friends should bring out the best in us. Come on. Am I preaching to any kids here? Hallelujah. Oh, the parents saying, amen. Hallelujah. Okay. See, Jesus wants to be your best friend. Why? Because Jesus wants to bring the best out of you. I remember my best friends back in high school. We didn't do the best things. They weren't even, if you want to get it according to biblical standards, they weren't even good friends because we didn't do a lot of good things. See, Jesus wants to be your best friend because he wants to bring the best out of you. See, he wants the best out of you more than you want the best out of yourself. See, true friendship, though, is independent of time. It doesn't wear out over the passing time. I bet you we all have friends that maybe you haven't seen for five years, ten years, and you go and see them and you just take up where you left off. You ever, ever had anybody like that? Just a friend like that? Those are good friends. It says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So true friendship is independent of time. Number two, true friendship is independent of circumstances. They are with you in the good times. They are with you in the bad times. I didn't say they condone what you do, but they're with you. I've known people, has anybody ever said, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm behind you, I'm behind you, and you turn around and they're so far behind you, you can't see them. I thought, I thought you were behind me. I am way behind you. See, our friends need us even more when it's not good. They need a righteous voice. They need a, a voice that proclaims light in their lives. See, true friendship isn't shaken by slander. Over in Proverbs 16, 28, it says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisper separates the best of friends. I don't care if you're in junior high, elementary, high school, college, or an adult. People always try to separate friends. Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about so-and-so? I'm telling you what, folks, if you probably took out the untruthful things out of social media, there wouldn't be much left on there. And yet it separates people. See, true friendship outlives unworthy treatment. Has a good friend of yours ever dumped on you before? You know what? A true friendship, I'm not saying you go right back underneath the dump truck, dump truck, but you know what? You're going to step away, and a true friend says, you know what? I know they dumped on me, and maybe I'm not going to go right back there right away again, but you know what? There's a reason they dumped on me. And instead of me making it about me, I'm going to try to get in their shoes and pray for them. And the last thing, true friendship, not, the sermon's not over. Last on this one, hallelujah, okay? I didn't want you to get your hopes up too high, okay? The airplane isn't ready to land yet, hallelujah, okay? True friendship doesn't compete with each other. 
True friendship doesn't compete with each other. How happy are you when your friend beats you in a race? How happy are you if your friend gets promoted to varsity? How happy are you? Do you understand what I'm saying? We're not competing with each other. See, every human friendship is at the best imperfect. And once we discover this fact, we really only have two choices. We can either retreat into ourselves and build walls around us, or we can acknowledge these imperfections that they do exist and still allow this friendship to grow and mature in spite of them. The only perfect friend you and I will ever have is Jesus. Now, I'm not going to have them put these up on the screen, but this is what Jesus is for you. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus wants to be your companion when you are lonely. This is a friend. In Hebrews 13, 6, Jesus wants to be your helper in your time of need. In Psalm 91, 2, he wants to be your refuge when trouble surrounds you. In Acts 11:22, 22, he wants to be the encourager to you when you feel discouraged. In Joel 2, 15, he wants to be the restorer of life when things have been stolen from you. In Luke 4, 18, he wants to be your healer when your heart is broken. In 1 John 2, 1, he wants to be your defender when other people are accusing you. In Hebrews 13, 6, Jesus wants to be your friend when everybody else has forsaken you. And Acts 2, 21, Jesus wants to be your savior when the world tells you you're not worth saving. That's what Jesus wants. Jesus said in Mark 5, 19 and 20, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, this is after he heals the man who was in, in Gadarenes, who was full of a demon, a legion. He said to them, he, this guy wanted to follow Jesus, and Jesus said, would not permit him, but he said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and he, how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim to, in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all that were marveled. See, what Jesus does in your life, maybe here at church or maybe at your home or at work or whatever, what Jesus does, he doesn't want us to keep it to ourselves. He wants us to go and tell our friends. Jesus is alive. Jesus is doing things in my life. See, so many times we never do that. And people say, why would I want to go to church? There's nothing there. It's dead. What has Jesus done for you? See, we have not been good at proclaiming what he has done for us. See, God desires we share our experiences with those closest to us. Why? Because then you have credibility that no one else has. You have influence with them that no one else has. I look back to Randy and Lori. They got good friends. Okay, couples. I could go and tell them about Jesus. And they look at me and they who's this dude? Because I have no influence, credibility. But if you tell them what Jesus has done for you, then they have credit, they have credibility and influence in those people's lives. See, I think that's been one of the things. You ever notice in America they tell you when you go get your hair cut? And Marilyn told me I had a great haircut the last night. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, hallelujah. They always tell you, don't talk about religion or politics. I tell you what, folks, you know what I think is more screwed up in this country than ever before? Religion and politics. Hallelujah. Maybe we ought to. You know, just make sure you know who's cutting your hair. You might get a mohawk when you go in there when you wanted a, you know, a mullet. Hallelujah, okay? But, uh, but see, the devil is supposed to don't talk about those things. I tell you what, when Jesus does something good for me, you can't shut me up anyway. Hallelujah. Yeah, amen, okay. Thank you, Bob. Hey, Bob, I represent that. Hallelujah, okay? But I tell you what, Jesus does something good for me. I'm not going to let it go silent. I'm not going to let it go silent. Because what he's done for me, the world needs to know he's do, he can do for them. Amen? See, my children, okay? My children ask me many times, Mom and I, is it really important who my friends are and who I hang out with? Little Zion over here. Are your mom and dad mean to you sometimes? Be honest. Depends. Do they ever tell you can't, can't hang out with that person, maybe? Mm -hmm. And is it because they're mean to you? Is that what you think? You liar. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> you think that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we used to tell, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called you that, Zion. I'm sorry. You told a fib, didn't you? Sometimes. What? No, nothing. <laughs> we used to tell our kids, it does matter who you hang out with. 
it does matter who you hang out with. Because your life and my life are influenced by two things. Number one, what we really believe in. You know, I hear people say, I believe this, I believe that. No, see, you only believe what you live. You can tell me everything you believe in. I want to know what you live. Because what you live is what you believe in. And number two, what influences your life is the associates or the friends you have. How do I know? 1 Corinthians 15, 33, read this. My kids, they could have quoted this verse to us. Because we told it to them all the time. Do not be deceived. You know what? You know what the Bible says, do not be deceived? You know what that really means? That's where we can be deceived. See, he, did, he didn't say that's a lot of things. But how many times do you, our kids, or maybe we as adults, think we can hang out with people? God says, be not deceived. Look at Evil company corrupts good habits. See, who you and I hang out with is going to have a direct impact on how we look at life. So you know what? Why should we know where our children are? Why should we know who they hang out with? Because evil company corrupts good habits or character. Maybe somebody here needs to cut some strings with some adult friends. Because they're hanging out with the wrong people. We had a gentleman down in Jamaica when we were missionaries down there. He, he, he loved Jesus, and he had just recently got divorced. And I said, how'd that happen? He says he'd gone on a mission trip. And his sister started taking his wife to the bars on a mission trip. And his sister. And by the time he got back, she wanted nothing to do with ministry. She wanted nothing to do with him. She wanted everything to do with the world. What happened? Evil company corrupts good character. Well, I don't know if I believe all that. I'm glad. Go to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26. It says, look, the righteous should choose his friends carefully. For the way of the wicked leads them astray. Why do you think you always need to know where I'm at? Because I was a kid once too. In fact, I was a naughty kid too, okay? Not proud of it, but you know what? But I am what I am, so I might as well use it to my advantage, okay? Hallelujah. So it says it. The righteous choose their friends carefully. For the way of the wicked leads them astray. You know what we used to tell our kids? And I'm not saying our kids were perfect. I know that. But what I used to tell our kids all the time, you're not going to be the sacrificial lamb. Well, Dad, don't these people need Jesus? Yes, they do. But when you got five that are not good and five that is good, I got news for you. You know what happens? Usually it's not the one influence in the five. It's the five influence in the one. So what I'm saying is, if you want to have, a, and we should all have unbelievers in our life, but if we're going to have unbelievers in our life, let's make sure we outnumber them, hallelujah. Let's make sure we show them the light of Jesus Christ. Let's show them the goodness of God. So they'll want to be a part of that, and we'll lead them into the light. I want to ask all a very, very, a very important question this morning. Do you belong to Jesus? Not in some general sense, but in a real and personal way. Remember the very first thing I said, probably most of you don't, but I'll tell you. The very first thing I said was an invitation represents something that's powerful and personal. Today, Jesus wants to personally invite each and every one of us into his family. He already said he was our friend. Now he wants us to become part of his family. He has the power to deliver us with his wonderful, with his wonderful promise. All he's waiting for is a yes from us be part of that family. It's kind of interesting here. How does somebody actually become a part of a family? Three ways. Little Channing through adoption. Through a lot of us, through birth. And maybe the third one most, through marriage. Those are how you become part of a family. Birth, adoption, and marriage. And you know what's amazing? Over in, you don't need to turn to it, but over in, in John 3, 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. Over in uh, Ephesians 1, 5, it tells us we've been given adoption. And over in Ephesians 5, 27, it's talked about the marriage piece of being married to Jesus. See, he wants us to be covered. 
by being born again, having that spirit of adoption, and being married. You know, I thought about that this morning as I was kind of going over this. A three-chord strand is not easily broken. God wants you to know you can be born again. That gets you in the family. He's given you the spirit of adoption. That's in Romans 8, 15. And that we, Jesus is married. We're the bride and he's the groom. He wants you to know you're secure. What I have here in life is a rope. Stick with me. I'm, I tell you, it's my sermon, so I get to do what I want. Hallelujah, okay? I'm going to tie this around here. Okay? I'm going to pull this rope. I tell you what, I only use the finest in nylon rope. Okay, I want you to know that. Uh, believe me, if I go out the door, I got this, this microphone here, okay? Hallelujah. You may not see me, but you can't get away from me. Hallelujah, okay? I want you to look at this rope. Because this rope really represents heaven. Okay? This rope represents heaven. This rope is telling us about our lives. And this rope really represents heaven and part of our time on this earth. Oh, that's great. Now, I want you to look up here. Here. You see here? I got some different colored tape there. The green tape. That, to me, represents our conception and birth. Green. And if you see that, it's just a little bit. Then I have here the red. That represents the terrible twos. Okay, not really. Okay, but it represents us being teenagers, okay, and all this. The gray, I made it a little bit longer because that represents us from being from teenagers to adults and living through life, okay? Also, it gives us this time a little more gray in our hair. And the blue represents end of our life. This rope represents eternity. Isn't it crazy? What we do in this little part here determines all of that. Does anybody else think that's crazy? Everything. This rope represents eternity, and this little bit determines where we spend all that. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you're just trying to scare people, preacher. No, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm trying to tell them the truth. You really believe in that hereafter stuff? Yes, I do. What happens if I'm wrong? I'm just going to be laid in the, maybe the earth. They'll take my ashes. I told my son, sprinkle little ashes on Lambeau Field and Kinnick Stadium. That's what I told him to do. I said, kind of like Shawshank Redemption, put it in your, in your pants. And go walk along Kinnick Stadium and shuffle a little up there. And when you go to get the Lambeau Field, shuffle a little right there. If you do that for Dad, I'll be happy. So what ends if I'm believing in this life ever after? And Jesus said, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Jesus said he is the way and the truth and life. And he said no one can get this except through him. Not Buddha, not all these other reasons. No, only through Jesus. We're not talking about joining a church. We're not talking about following rules and regulations. We're talking about Jesus. So what happens if I'm wrong and there's none of this? Okay, I'm guilty. I stayed faithful to my wife for right now 44 years. I paid my bills on time. I treated people with dignity and respect. Guilty! What is if you're wrong? What is if you're wrong? See, if I'm wrong, I didn't lose nothing. If you're wrong, you lost all of this. Based on this little bit. We're not talking about joining. all wonderful things to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not knocking those. But those things don't get you to heaven. 
It's the decisions we make in this little bit of time decides what we're going to do there. You might ask yourself, well, I don't need that, preacher. Maybe not. But you know what? We need to realize this is salvation. You know, I've heard so many excuses. Have you ever heard, I'm good enough? I, have you ever heard, I didn't kill anybody? You ever heard that? Great, okay, you didn't kill anybody. That's a low standard, isn't it? Hallelujah. <laughs> See, what we need to realize about Jesus is Jesus didn't go to the cross to make bad people good. People, Jesus went to the cross to make dead people alive. Jesus didn't go to the cross to make bad people good. He went to the cross to make dead people alive. I'm going to ask you, sir, is anybody here perfect? Raise your hand. We cast a lion's beard out of you. Hallelujah. Okay? So no one here. Now, I'm just asking. So everybody is telling me here they're not perfect. Is that correct? Say yes, Pastor Jeff. Okay, I just want to make sure. So everybody here has told me that they're not perfect. Okay, so what you're telling me is that we have all made mistakes, we've all missed the mark, and we've all sinned. Is that safe to say? Come on. You know what's amazing? Over in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For the wages are all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. So it's telling us we're all sinners. We've all missed the mark. Pastor, I'm... I'm a good person. No, you just told me you sinned. Let's eliminate all the good person talk. You just admitted to me and before God, and I admitted to you before God that I have sinned. I have missed the mark. I made mistakes. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we've just experienced Romans 3.23, which brings us to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, you just admitted to me, we have admitted, admitted together that we have sinned. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. That we have sinned. So that means because you and I have sinned, wages are going to be given out. Isn't that what the Bible said? No, not yet. Okay, hallelujah. No, I thought, man, I got a big one on the back. Hallelujah. Eternity's pulling. Uh, yeah, eternity is pulling at Ron. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> so we've admitted that we've all sinned. We've admitted none of us are perfect. And then the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So what it's really saying is you and I have punched our time card and we have wages coming towards us. And those wages, the sin is death. So now we're not, so according to what you told me this morning, that none of us are perfect, that means we're, the wages of sin is death. We are dead people. That's what you just told me, according to the Bible. That doesn't mean we're not walking around, but spiritually dead, we are. So now, but Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So now what we need to decide, see, wages are, being, are going to be paid out for us, for our actions. Wages are going to be paid out. If you go to work and you work 40 hours, don't you expect wages for 40 hours? Come on. That's what we all do. But now we have to decide, and all this rope is talking about it, do I want to accept those wages or why let Jesus take those wages for me? Because see, if you and I will make Jesus the Lord of our life, if we'll confess that we're a sinner, if we ask Jesus to come into our life, it doesn't mean you've been a, ch a good church guard. No, forget all that stuff. If you will say, I have made a mistake, wages of death are coming towards me, so I'm going to ask Jesus to stand in the gap for me. He will, and he'll exchange death for life. See, that's why Jesus came to the cross. 
not to make bad people good. Does it make dead people alive? See, church membership doesn't do that. Reading your Bible doesn't do it. Praying doesn't do all those things. Those are all wonderful things. We should do those things. But what happens is we have to make a decision for Jesus. I can ask everybody to stand up, please. 